One in five Americans suffer from chronic pain. Many are now using CBD for relief. Activists are hoping pot could be legalized nationwide by the end of 2019. When you look at premium cannabis, the Illinois House approved legalizing recreational marijuana. Welcome to The Budding Report a weekly show centered around all things cannabis. Please join us in welcoming our host, Charles Horton, and his co-host, Melissa Nassitz, as they share the latest in cannabis news, conduct interviews with top leaders in the cannabis space, and promote some of the latest in science and innovation. And now to our host, Charles Horton. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to The Budding Report. Uh, first episode where we are missing Chris, our legal expert. He's had some uh, home family issues and is having to uh, step away, but if anybody's an attorney and watching this, we'd love to fill that spot. It's great having both a medical and a legal expert on the show to uh, to chime in. But uh, Christian, welcome, uh, welcome again. Good to see you. How are you doing today? I'm great, Charles. Always a pleasure being on the show. Nice to see you guys. Weather's starting to warm up. As I said last week, I, I think uh, we're only going to get hotter from here. <laughs> I, I, uh, <laughs> I'm glad I'm not in, uh, in, in Phoenix. Today, guest hosting. Melissa had to be out for the day, but uh, guest hosting, we have both uh, Denise and Jessica from Canna World and many other, uh, many other places. Ladies, welcome. Thank you for uh, joining us today. Wonderful to be back again, Charles. Thank you so much for the invite. Thanks and for I know having I, us. And I know I helped uh, uh, helped you with uh, being a moderator on your Canna World Expo show this weekend, and uh, you do it again next weekend. Uh, tell us a little bit about that and how you think it went. I know I thought it was great. <laughs> it was incredible. Um, every quarter, we bring together more than twenty four speakers to give an industry update. This is completely free to the public and we appreciate all of our speakers' time. Um, it is on a Saturday, the first two Saturdays of every quarter and we covered a lot of ground. Um, we covered basically all the resources you could possibly imagine to grow a cannabis business and that was only part one. So we continue again this Saturday uh, by the time this broadcast airs, uh, everything will be on the website and able to digest in bite-sized bits. I highly recommend you getting on there and watching it. A lot of great speakers, and you can watch it at your own pace. So watch one speaker, come back a little bit later, watch another speaker if you like. Like uh, Denise said, it's all free, so highly suggest you get on there and watch. Our uh, guests today <laughs> include Nick Warrender, co-founder and CEO of Lifted Made, and Nathaniel Gurian, founder and CEO of FinCan, who I just uh, had on uh, I was moderator of his section on the uh, ladies show this uh, last weekend, so it's good to have you back. But this week, our uh, news uh, to talk about is four more states could still legalize marijuana this year after New Mexico, New York, and Virginia. So that's pretty uh, that's pretty excited to me. Exciting to me. I'm a uh, New Mexico uh, native, and so it was good to hear that they just uh, passed their uh, their their uh, recreational marijuana bill. And then there's uh, four states. So that still look like they could pass legal ma legalized marijuana this session, and that includes uh, Connecticut, Delaware, Minnesota, and uh, Rhode Island. So uh, that's all really good news. What do you think, guys? Great. I think it's, I think it's incredible for accessibility. I have watched the industry since I jumped in in, in late 2013 when CBD was coming to the mainstream. And you could see slowly state by state was waking up, adopting laws and making the plant accessible to the people. So watching it go from a fraction of the states to half of all states to more than half of all states to where it is now is literally an incredible journey. And it speaks a lot for what the public requires at this point for total health and wellness. So I think it's very positive. I'm wondering well, you know, how many the, the other uh, states thing is that, we um, get legalized with it before uh, before the federal government uh, comes in and, uh, and acts, and I, I keep hoping that's gonna be soon. Yeah, that was my point. I think that 
the more the states start to jump on board, you're going to have a snowball effect. And eventually uh, there's only going to be a minority group uh, of states that are going to really oppose it until the end. And I think at that point, you're going to have a lot of push for a federal uh, legalization effort. Well, and and on the banking side, um, you know, the thing is that there is no um, uh, actual um, federal restriction on cannabis banking. The um, the obstacle has been that the uh, bankers have felt that it's a um, disreputable and shady business practice. Um, and, uh, you know, frankly, um, even more so than the passage of the um, really not particularly effective, but feel good, safe banking act. You know, I feel that um, the states that have come on board this year and the ones that are um, on track to do so will have a much more encouraging effect on bankers than something like the safe banking act. You know, we've been talking uh, really good things about the the safe banking act. And then I heard uh, your session on it. It, you know, made a lot of sense. So it's good to have different views and and uh, be able to balance what's going on. And I had no earthly idea that there wasn't any existing uh, regulation stopping banks. So I look forward to uh, addressing that more in uh, more in your section. Nick, what do you think? Well, I think it's fantastic. You know, we're, as a company, been really focused on the hemp industry, particularly because, you know, we're a publicly traded company. We're looking to get on NASDAQ. So it's been limiting us from working on the medical and recreational cannabis side, but, you know, this is a a big push in the right direction. And I think that more public companies will be able to come here in the United States and and get listed on the big trading platforms and just create more value throughout that process. Aside from all the consumer benefits that come along with that, you know, decrease in prescription drug use, decrease in alcohol use. Uh, We're seeing a lot of benefits aside from just tax and revenues in these states. And um, I look forward to Wisconsin coming on board personally. Nice. Well, Got a little dis- bit of ways to go there. So <laughs> I was disappointed this week to hear that uh, it, it looks like Biden is dropping altogether his push for uh, legalized uh, uh, cannabis. Uh, but uh, Chuck Schumer is still going to keep pushing it uh, anyway. So that's the that's the good news out of it. And I hope Biden's not going to uh, try to slow it down. Jessica, anything you want to add on this subject? Well, kind of what goes back to what you said a bit earlier, and I think we actually touched on this in one of your previous shows, is once there are enough states that have legalized cannabis and we get to that point, it becomes a federal issue. Right now, as you well know, you might have, like we have, I'm here in Las Vegas, Nevada. Nevada is legal. California is legal. However, if you go between states with cannabis, you are a federal criminal. So I'm hoping, and I know hopium is quite the drug. However, (laughs) I think that once we get to that tipping point, that hundredth monkey that you might want to even utilize as a, a phrase, where it needs to become federally legalized and the stigma the criminality and everything that is associated with the plant and the industry becomes null and void. And we're, we have a viable, legitimate industry that is um, allowed. I hate to be uh, broadcasting from Texas, who's probably going to be one of the uh, the longest holdouts in the process, but at least right now they're looking at bills to expand the uh, medical marijuana program, and most importantly to me, they're looking to uh, to do more to decriminalize uh, uh, the uh, you know parts of the plant. So that's that's looking good. Uh, I know the we've talked about this on the show many times. One of the big problems in Texas is that it's pretty much just a misdemeanor if you have under two ounces of the uh, flower, but if you have uh, like some edibles that you bought in uh, in Col- Colorado or up and coming New Mexico, uh, as Chris used to tell us, there's a poor lady doing older lady like in her 60s doing 50 years in uh, jail for bringing gummies back from Colorado, and that's a that's a complete shame. Well, we'll end this uh, segment of the news. We're going to take a quick commercial break and we'll be ba- right back with Nick Warrender. See you in just a minute. Hello, hello. Coming to you from the outdoors where I do my heat training and I did my repeats on the hills. It's actually pretty empty, but it's kind of close to 90 degrees. 
So uh, that's when I squeeze in whatever I can, but I'm actually here to share what uh, Simply Start, Simply Satisfy is. So this organic hemp oil, this is the serum Simply Start, and you can take it twice a day or once. I already took both of them in this morning, so now it's lunchtime. Real quick and easy, yummy, delicious, 30 calories. The other one is Simply Satisfy. So it's a spray and also three sprays. You could do it once a day or twice a day. Again, I did it this morning. I'm doing it now uh, at lunch. Uh, it helps you take care of your health and wellness. So learn more about them. Remember three simple changes on how you can incorporate into your life. You can learn more at the link below. So stay safe and keep moving, keep training and take care of your spirit, mind and body. Hi, welcome back to the Budding Report. And today we have our one of our special guests is Nick Warrender. He is the co-founder and CEO of Lifted Made. And does Nick have quite the story for us? He actually started Lifted Made with just $900 out of his parents' warehouse manufacturing and distributing premium e-liquid in the space of uh, about seven years ago. He quickly grew that with his expertise in design and marketing, and he increased his production and effective staff to move into a 4,000 square foot facility in Zion, Illinois. Okay, so he is actually located out of Zion, Illinois. He pivoted to CBD a few years ago and hand sanitizer to get through the pandemic. Uh, Nick Warner has always been able to adapt and stay ahead of the curve He's been uh, instrumenting uh, instrumental in uh, R&D on Delta-8. So that's one of those new and upcoming topics as well. And that's, um, and he's been influential in this months prior to his first market launch in July of 2020. So with his rapid development um, and Herb's finest flowers flagship brand under Lifted Me, has captured and grown the market share greatly as a nationally recognized brand. And he's actively moving to take over the cannabis space. So with that, we are going to uh, move into our, our interview with Nick. So Nick, I have a question for you. I'd like to start with what describes the culture of Lifted Made and how do your personal experiences impact the direction? Sure. Thanks for the great intro, Jessica. Um, I'm actually here in our new facility. We just moved into a 12,000 square foot facility here in Kenosha, Wisconsin. So we just got over the border uh, out of Illinois and away from some extra taxes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, culture for us is a, is a huge thing. You know, we started with a handful of employees. Now we're up to about 50 um, and a big portion of our business has been focused on putting people in places where they can grow. You know, nobody wants to feel stagnant. People want to feel like they can grow with the company, that they can move up in rankings. Um, so when we built out this facility, we wanted to make sure that we had uh, a, our brand in in this facility. So when you walk in, you're kind of transitioned into a whole new world. Um, we have great design studios. Um, we have meditation areas. We have areas where people can take proper breaks and not only talk about business, but about life. Um, so we've taken a personal approach to really understand our employees, um, what their goals are within the business as well as within life and, you know, how we can all help to grow together. So it's, it's really a family type orientation in our business because uh, we want healthy people. We want healthy mentalities. Um, and we want people to feel like they can come in here and grow with us as we continue to grow this business. Uh, I'm going to ask two questions. My first question is, uh, is you're a public company and you're planning on getting uh, NASDAQ listed. So I had a belief because all, most of the uh, cannabis companies are out of, uh, out of Canada. And I was having a belief that it was illegal. Like I believed that uh, the federal government had big problems with, uh, with banks banking the industry. So talk to me about uh, being able to be listed and, and uh, the government's view of being a public company right now. 
Yeah, sure. So a little over a year ago, we finalized a merger acquisition with a company called Acquired Sales Corp. Uh, the ticker symbol is AQSP. Um, and the baseline for that business was to do a consolidation, particularly in the hemp derivative space, um, more mostly focused on brand and consumer facing products. Um, so through our due diligence and talking with NASDAQ, you know, as long as this is federally legal and everything falls within the, the 2018 farm bill, um, along with proper documentation, paperwork, COAs, chain of custodies, then there's, there is no issue in uplisting to NASDAQ uh, as long as you're functioning within that, that federal farm bill. Makes sense. Well, where do you see Lifted made in the next few years in regard to the cannabis space and the plethora of cannabinoids being researched? Yeah, so it's a, I wear two hats. I'm the CEO of Lifted Made and the COO of Acquired Sales Corp. Um, so from the operating company, you know, we're really focused now on these new emerging cannabinoids. Uh, we were one of the first brands to market with Delta 8. Um, we're now working on formulas that are really specific to effects. So we're doing some kind of designer blends with CBC, CBG and Delta 8, uh, Delta 10 and CBG and THCV we're, we're looking into. So there's, uh, there's been a lot of like isolated cannabinoids in full spec and broad spec. And now I'd really see the industry moving towards um, these highly formulated blends that give really specific effects so that, you know, you can stay sharp throughout the day. You can help unwind at night. You can help sleep better through, through different types of products and blends. So aside from formulations, you know, we really feel that branding in this space is very important and that cannabinoids should be looked at more as an, an, an ingredient rather than part of your actual brand story. Um, so we've spent a lot of time understanding who our target audience is, how we can develop really cool brands that are specific to who we're going after. Um, you know, cannabis can make it difficult as a brand because it's kind of everything for everyone, right? So you create products and um, you want to just be able to target everyone. And that's very difficult from a marketing perspective. So we felt that niching down in our brand offerings and really understanding who our target audience is has helped us differentiate ourselves in, you know, this really fast growing and super competitive marketplace. Um, from the public company standpoint, you know, we're looking for good entrepreneurs that are growing successful, profitable businesses. And we're creating this ecosystem where companies can go public. Uh, it's a very decentralized approach. They continue to grow their business and their operations, um, but they get the advantages of being public, which comes with uh, a lot of collaborations between companies, better buying power, and kind of putting all these different great entrepreneurs that have, you know, that are great at what they do, but might not be the best at other areas. So, We'd like to continue to kind of roll up the, the good businesses in this industry and bring these people together to help get through compliance in the future, uh, to help raise capital and just create as much value through all of this hard work as possible. So we've taken a, a flip the paradigm on how public companies typically operate with this very um, centralized approach. And we're going with a, a very decentralized approach where the public company is a servant to the operating companies. And we think that that's a recipe that could be really successful in this, in this industry. If we have time, I have a question for you, Nick. Could you sure. briefly describe Delta 8 THC for the viewers that aren't as familiar with it as sure. Delta 9? Yeah, certainly. So um, there's a couple main differences with Delta 8 and Delta 9 THC. Um, in regards to Delta 8, in comparison to Delta 9, you it's a very clear-headed, uplifting, euphoric feeling. Um, you don't get the foggy-headedness. You don't get the anxiety. Um, there's really no come-down or couch-lock effect or feeling. So it's, uh, it's, it's a great feeling product. You know, I think it's a lot of what some consumers were expecting CBD to be like, where you take it and you feel something immediately. Um, so we've noticed that combining Delta A with these other cannabinoids that have, you know, zero intoxicating effects, 
this has a slightly intoxicating effect, um, but it doesn't have a lot of the negative connotations that people typically associate with THC in general. So we're noticing people that hated uh, marijuana, that hated Delta 9 THC, that are trying this and saying, oh, this is really nice. Um, it gets me through my day. It doesn't take me out of my zone. I can continue to operate. Uh, I can have difficult conversations and, you know, I'm fully present. So uh, it's, it is a type of THC, but it's very different than Delta 9. I know there's a lot of articles that say it's like diet weed, um, but it's, it's really not comparable. I say that it, it has legs of its own and it kind of stands by itself from an efficacy standpoint and effect standpoint. So I guess I'll round up the questions um, and referring back to when you were discussing uh, these specific effects and more tailored blends of individual cannabinoids, what is your company's process on actually doing these assessments uh, to, to generate that, that research? Sure. Uh, so we do a lot of in-house testing. We have a pretty large staff, and then we have a lot, a large client base throughout the U.S. So um, we will typically put a formula together and then start doing internal testing on it, um, just whiteboarding the type of effects that we're feeling, um, and then we'll test that with males, females, young, old, and make an assessment on, okay, is this more of an unwinding effect? Is this more of a euphoric effect? Does this have more creativity to it? Um, as well as just a lot of research on terpenes that have already been done in the past. So combination of these specific isolated cannabinoids along with terpene blends have given us the ability to really kind of dial in um, an expectation when you take a product. With your entrepreneurial story going from uh, from bootstrapping to a public company, I have just one more question as as uh, as we end this segment because uh, I'm, I've been really interested in seeing where Delta Eight's going. Are you having any difficulties uh, shipping? Are there states that uh, have outlawed Delta Eight? Yeah, so there is a handful of states that have outlawed Delta Eight. Um, one thing that we're facing as an industry is this new PACT Act, which was really designed for shipping uh, nicotine and tobacco vapable products. However, the way that they defined it is any other substance. So there's a big assumption that this includes hemp derived products and really anything that can be vape related. Um, so that's created a lot of issues with shipping, particularly direct to consumer. Um, anything that's vapable, so cartridges, disposables, things of that nature. Um, it's created more taxes, more reporting, and it, it is strangulating to a, to a degree. Uh, but the caveat to that is we hope that this increases business for brick and mortar locations. Um, they've been hit over the years with uh, competition online that doesn't carry nearly as much overhead. Um, there's a lot of fly by night companies. Anybody can make a website on, on Shopify right, or Shopkeep. So, um, we're hoping that yes, this creates more work for us as a manufacturer and distributor, but we really hope that this helps out the brick and mortar stores who have really been drugged through the dirt and had to deal with COVID and carry all this overhead and really worked hard to survive, uh, that we hope this is like an injection and more business to them as we can still get these products in brick and mortar, mortar stores and we can help drive some of the traffic that we got online back to, to their businesses. Well, thank you, Nick. That was very educational. We're going to end this seg segment and go off to a commercial break. If you'd like to contact Nick or any of our guests, please go to our website, thebuddingreport.com. They'd love to uh, hear from you. We'll be right back after this message. Hello, hello, here on my lunch run in the middle of the heat where I get my break really quick after training clients and training leading some classes. I am taking my Simply Satisfy. It is three sprays, organic hemp. Uh, next one is my Simply Start. You can take it twice a day or once a day. I already took one morning dose. I'm now taking my afternoon dose. One little yummy organic hemp. Try to check them out, Simply Genius. Helicopter. <laughs> All right, time to go train and run down the hill. Bye-bye. <laughs> Welcome back to the Budding Report. Thank you so much for joining us. I am one of your guest co-hosts today. And we have our next incredible guest, 
Nathaniel Gurian. He is the founder and CEO of FinCan. And boy, is this man a plethora of information, let me tell you. Uh, we've had the wonderful delight of being able to have him as a part of Canada World Expo. And now we get to have him, his presence here again on the budding report. So let me give you just a little bit of background about him because there is actually so much to share that we can spend this whole time talking about it. Uh, let me just point out a few little facts that Nathaniel has decades of experience working with accountants, bankers, financiers, lenders, and government officials. I know he was speaking a lot about the various agencies and the rules and the regulations uh, just on Saturday with us. And as an entrepreneur in the legal, regulated cannabis industry, he's recognized the importance of transparency, compliance, confidentiality, regulation, and client loyalty, uh, not only as an indi individual, but for the sake of our fledgling industry and community as it transitioned from black market operations to the mainstream. And with all the new states that are looking at uh, legalizing cannabis, it's just going to be expanding even more so, and his knowledge is going to be invaluable. So with that little tidbit, uh, Nathaniel, can you please tell us about FinCan? Well, sure, and uh, thanks for inviting me. It's my pleasure to be here and, uh, you know, perhaps uh, share a few of uh, perspectives and experience we've had, uh, you know, battling on the front lines here with cannabis banking and payment solutions and related banking financial services type stuff. Um, it basically, um, early on, four years ago, um, I became aware of the fact as I was playing a little bit with the cannabis banking challenges, um, I became aware of the fact that the idea that there was a federal restriction on cannabis banking was actually a canard that was put out by the bankers as a pretext to cover up the fact that they just basically didn't like the business and didn't want to be associated with it. And it had a, you know, a disreputable um, and uh, shady uh, um, aspect to it that they found distasteful, uh, but they didn't really want to admit that. So they created this whole thing about the it, that they were concerned about liabilities and losing their insurance and their banking license and criminal aiding and abetting narcotics trafficking and you know a whole bunch of other dust and smoke that they kicked up. But I was able to get behind the scenes of that um, and realize that it had to do with how they felt about it and that making inroads on this would be. In, in, would involve many different um, touch points of changing how they feel, which is a lot more difficult to do than just to make a logical argument and, you know, and counter somebody's factual concerns. Um, the bankers were not interested in any facts. They just didn't want to do it and they didn't want to hear about it. Um, so um, we went about um, approaching it that way. And over the last, well, five years or so, we have built up a network of a couple hundred banks around the country that are industry friendly. Um, there's no one bank that, uh, that does it all or has an interest in banking all sectors and all aspects and all operators. They all have their individual appetites and, um, and preferences, which are ever shifting and evolving based on, um, you know, how, how they're, when they actually go out with their programs um, and they are in the real marketplace, they discover other challenges that cause them to, um, you know, to move forward or backward or change their policies or whatever. So um, we've been very involved with that. And at this point in time, as of fourth quarter of last year, FinCan now has, uh, can really basically state definitively that there is no cannabis banking problem any longer because we now can, um, can get a compliant, transparent, real, sustainable bank account for anybody in any sector of the industry um, in every state. Um, and, um, you know, although merchant processing is not um, 
quite as well developed across all sectors. Uh, we certainly have traditional merchant processing for CBD and hemp and ancillaries and investment funds um, and a number of other folks, um, people who um, do business with the industry. Um, as far as people who touch the plant are concerned, we have a lot of very good solutions. Um, you know, some of them are still um, works in progress, but are pretty solid. Um, but, um, you know, we're in pretty good shape with that. So FinCan at this point is divided into um, five operating departments, one for banking services that help people get bank accounts, another for merchant processing, another for um, financing, including um, lending. We have um, a lot of banks as well as private lenders, as well as equity investors that um, are, um, are willing to provide a, a wide range of financing and access to capital services. Um, we also um, are standing up a new fully constituted department called the, our uh, Department of Financial Institutions, which is going to make a substantial outreach directly to banks to um, help them on board and begin to support one or more sectors of the industry. Um, and then we have another department um, that I head up for special projects and, um, and custom advisory. Um, and, um, you know, one of the, I think, probably major cultural differences with um, FinCan is that FinCan is entirely a collaborative operation with many people who do things that might ordinarily be considered competitive. So um, if there are... Um, if there are companies that uh, that are providing compliance services to banks and thereby um, they're really the gatekeeper to those banks for uh, people in the industry, we collaborate with them. So part of their so their network becomes part of our network. Um, if there are companies um, that you know, a lot of companies are out there offering, for example, compliant banking services um, and turnkey. Um, solutions and transaction monitoring platforms and so on for these banks, um, but they are out promoting their own solution, um, and they either um, they they either live or die on whether a um, bank decides that their solution is better than one of the other dozen guys. We, on the other hand, represent and can present to a bank any one of these dozen solutions. You know, kind of like an independent insurance agent. So, um, you know, by embracing and collaborating with everybody else in the industry who is doing similar vertically integrated stuff, um, FinCan becomes sort of like, um, you know, a one-stop, um, uh, you know, um, uh, universe of all of these banking and financial services. So by coming to FinCan, um, a bank or somebody in the industry gets access to the entire ecosphere rather than just the particular narrow um, products and services that an individual company offers. Well, Nathaniel, it's a scary uh, industry to try to get into and get into banking. I had a financial services business, which the banks didn't like, uh, is uh, about the same. And I had developed a 20-year relationship with this bank. I had sold that company. I started a, a CBD MLM company. And uh, the first question on, I mean, one of the questions on the account form is, are you in this red flag industry? So I have to be honest and I check, uh, I check yes. And then uh, I wait for like three or four weeks to find out if the bank's going to uh, even accept my account. In my case, because of my relationship, they uh, they did, but it's a scary time. And I know a lot of people who have had to change banks and and uh, and, and go to different uh, banks a couple of times a year because of their bank account being closed. Uh, you answered a lot of my question already, Nathaniel, so I'm going to go ahead and pass to Denise now. Thank you. Um, and, and that's the point that I'd like to raise is that historically it's been incredibly difficult for cannabis businesses to operate as a traditional business. Uh, so it's it's been a deterrent, I feel, for some entrepreneurs to jump into the space. Uh, there has been a lot of stigma. There's a lot of myth busting that needs to occur. So I, just this past week, I heard from another company uh, that's in the space that lost their merchant account. It's not uncommon. Uh, Nathaniel, could you walk us through what it would be like for a company that touches the plant and also an ancillary company that's in the industry but does not touch the plant? What's the process for establishing a traditional banking account and merchant service account? 
Well, if you want the account to be sustainable, you have to um, kind of abide by a um, sort of a tagline that we use in our advertising right now, which is don't lie to your bank. Um, and don't lie to your bank includes don't omit things that they would um, possibly have a problem with. Um, you know, uh, to the extent that you do that, that's almost exactly directly proportional to the likelihood that at some point in time they will discover it. Um, they will have a problem with it and close your account. And, and one of the other problems with that is if they might have been amenable to um, having your account, um, the fact that you deceived them and they had to discover it um, makes them feel suspect that they're, you know, that at no point in time can they really necessarily trust that, that they have the complete story from you. And so they're, you're going to be in a higher risk category automatically by having deceived them to begin with. They're going to feel like, you know what, we don't know what else is going on that they're not telling us and we'd be better off you know, pulling this account at this point. So, you know, transparency um, and um, working with the bank and telling them exactly what you do and what you're intending to do and the scope of your operations um, is your best assurance of not having the bank account closed. And then, of course, the other problem is that, um, as we have recently seen from the um, EASA, uh, um, uh, you know, federal, um, uh, you know, prosecution um, for bank fraud, um, that um, that um, not that basically deceiving the bank constitutes bank fraud and um, you know is a serious federal offense and I think that this is a uh, a problem that um, may begin to uh, be getting a lot of um, serious and scary traction. Um, so now it becomes a matter of you know um, you know lying to the bank or um, misrepresenting what you're doing um, may turn into be may turn out to be a lot more than just an inconvenience of having to change bank accounts periodically or <clears throat> have funds cut off for a while or whatever. But <clears throat> you may we may we may be looking at facing you know much more serious consequences. I'd like to just get your perspective. Uh, on why there is such a real uh, spectrum of uh, merchant processing fees uh, offered. It, you can secure some reasonable fees, but at the same time, if you're not in the right loop, you're really paying a lot if you're starting up with a, a CBD company even only at this point. So I feel like there, it's very predatory on the banking system to do this. You mentioned a lot of risk. Uh, that goes into the assessments, but I, I feel that there's it's more arbitrary than that. Could you kind of comment? Um, well, you know, there's there's kind of two types of merchant processing. One are workarounds, which try to overlay some type of a, you know, permissible, <clears throat> you know, perhaps. Um, you know, make you know, making the transaction one step removed from cannabis. So, uh, for example, you might load a PayPal style wallet, which then would be um, what was used to actually pay the merchant. So technically, one could make the argument that it's not a cannabis related transaction. Um, and then what you run into is that you're adding another layer of cost involved because now that platform needs to, you know, needs to generate some revenue and pay for having been created. Um, and then on top of it, um, very often there are layers before you actually get to the bank that's that's settling the transactions. Um, and, but then on the other hand, if you're dealing with just traditional merchant processing, there is what is known in the payment processing industry of the interchange rate, which is basically what the MasterCard Visa licensed sponsor bank, which is the one who actually settles and, 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 and deals with the transactions, and the acquirer bank, which is licensed by MasterCard, Visa, American Express, and Discover to issue merchant accounts and to manage them. Okay, um, These guys basically take collectively what is known as an interchange fee. Um, and, and that uh, varies depending upon the type of transaction. Debit transactions are less expensive than credit transactions. Um, uh, transactions in which somebody shows up with the card and swipes or inserts it into a terminal are less expensive than ones which we call card not present, which are very often internet type transactions and so on. So that interchange rate can vary from any anywhere from almost nothing to upwards of, you know, two or two and a half percent. And what that basically is, is the bottom line, kind of like the, the net wholesale cost for merchant processing. Everything over and above that um, 
uh, is either profit for others who are in the payment chain, such as sales agencies or agents of the bank or agents of the processor, um, and um, and and sometimes some additional not very huge, generally somewhere between a tenth of a percent and half a percent of additional compliance fees that might be added on top of that wholesale interchange rate that could could bump that a little bit higher because of some of the extra compliance costs. Um, you know, uh, but basically that's traditional merchant processing. So, you know, for example, um, if you have a um, e-commerce company, the interchange rate is probably going to be nominally somewhat under two percent. Okay, but then on top of that two percent, you have various, um, uh, you know, uh, snouts, so to speak, that are um, at the trough, and that is, you know, one or two or three or four layers of salespeople. You know, because the acquirer who issues the merchant account would then. Um, you know, hire or contract with what we call ISOs. ISOs are independent sales organizations that, you know, uh, can, some of them do quite a lot of the processing and a lot of the risk taking and transaction monitoring. Some of them are just sales agencies, but almost all of them also operate in the merchant processing space with what they would call sub agents. So they put on partners to refer them customers. And there's a whole revenue share that goes on, you know, of the, let, let's say that, let's say that the nominal wholesale cost of the merchant processing is 2%, and let's suppose that the merchant is paying 4%. Well, that extra 2% is being cut up among these one, two, three, or four different little sales agents that are in that process. Um, you know, and then beyond that, of course, um, you know, when you get involved in these more complicated, um, compliance-rich, um, you know, you know, higher risk categories that require more supervision and people have to monitor websites and they have to monitor, uh, you know, uh, uh, COAs um, and they have to monitor the behavior of the merchants and so on. Um, you know, there are some additional costs involved and risks involved that are undertaken that these sales agents and the processors feel obliged and justified in charging a little bit more money to cover the extra cost of doing that, that they wouldn't normally have to do with, say, a bookstore or a gas station or a convenience store or, you know, or, you know, uh, you know, whatever. So, you know, that's kind of where the pricing is. Now, on the other hand, of course, on top of that, there's, you know, short-term greed and um, and sales sleaziness that can be added on top of that. So, you know, you can have a guy, you can have guys paying five or six or seven percent for merchant processing who really ought to be paying closer to, you know, maybe half that, you know, so our merchant processing, you know, for everything except for plant touching businesses is traditional standard merchant processing and basically CBD companies are going to come in around three and a half percent which is not a particularly unreasonable and horrifying number. I'd like to uh, have you back on on a different episode. We're out of time now, but uh, you've you've done a lot of myth busting, and I was told, for example, that uh, a lot of the rate height is because whoever writes the merchant account accepts all of the uh, risk from uh, from any kind of chargebacks. But I'd love to have you back on to talk about uh, that at a at another time. You've again been a, a great uh, guest, and a lot of information out of you. I wish you the best in in your success. If you'd like to contact uh, Nathaniel and get help with uh, banking. I know it can be a lonely, scary world when you're out there in this industry, especially trying to get uh, merchant uh, bank accounts and just checking accounts. So uh, uh, contact Nathaniel if you'd like uh, to get help in that environment. Nick, thank you again for being on. You can uh, reach any of our guests by going to our website at thebuddingreport.com. All of our guest information is on there for uh, contact. Please reach out and and do business with our guests, please. Next week, I'm excited to have a friend of mine, Isaac Montoya of Halcyon Holdings. Uh, when I started my uh, uh, venture capital company into the space, I spent a lot of time with uh, these guys learning and researching the industry, and they're just a wealth of knowledge, and it's good to have them on. And uh, Lilac Mazor of Power of Giving Tree Dispensary will be on. Love uh, love you to, for you to join us next week and, and uh, join us again on The Budding Report. Thanks so much for being on. You have a great day.